one student commented how how messy my bookcase was. <laughs> it's like he's like, so I have to clean it up because he's uh he's very concerned about my my bookcase and everything's about to fall <laughs> yeah. fall out of it. <laughs> it's very funny. It's like hey, you should listen to the video. Don't for, don't, for, don't worry about the bookcase. <laughs> uh, All right. Yeah, my table is also messy, but yeah. Uh, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so it is great to have you here. Yeah. We are with Physics Ninja. Awesome. Man. So I want to first of all start with asking why did you choose chose to study physics in college? Okay. Um, I had a great high school teacher. Uh, name was Pierre Sauvé. Uh, I grew up in the northern Ontario, Canada, and he was really the the best high school teacher that at my school, in my opinion. Uh, he would just not have any notes. He would just talk about stuff. And I thought he was able to solve like the hardest problems. Um, and then I went to college and I actually started out as a computer engineer. Um, this was uh, 1995. It was kind of the dot-com boom. Um, so everyone said, go do computer engineering. And I, I did the first year, but they soon realized it really wasn't for me. Um, so I had good uh, first year university uh, college professors and uh, one of them actually called me the summer after my first year and you know invited me to come join the physics department be a physics student at the university of ottawa in canada so yeah and then i just yeah decided to make the change and uh yeah it was a great decision for me uh it was a small department we were only uh, six students in physics uh, in our graduating class um so you know all right. So I also read in your uh, on your website for Physics Ninja that uh, you did research on. Uh, it says, let me read it. Actually, studying excitations in several magnetic material for your PhD. I think for your yeah. graduate work. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, for the PhD work. So we studied uh, um, thin magnetic materials. And there are excitations in those magnetic materials called, I mean, called spin waves. So you just kind of shake one little magnet and it, it can propagate as a wave in the material. Um, and you can study those waves in the magnetic material uh, using a light scattering. So you can shine a laser at the material and then study the light that gets reflected or transmitted. Um, I did the theory part, but we had a group that did uh, experiments on the material and they would send us uh, their results. And then we would come up with a mathematical model to uh, describe the experiment. So uh, that, that's what I did a lot. Yeah. It was fun. I mean, it was like just a lot of pen and paper work, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of computation. You have to solve large matrix equations and... Uh, yeah, learn a little bit about computational physics. And it was actually important that I did that because it it led me to uh, a job after my PhD that involved a lot more numerical methods in physics. So we did a lot more computer simulations after my PhD where I uh, went to work as a postdoc um, in Newfoundland. So. Yeah, actually, I wondered about that as well. I think you worked in Minneapolis, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah, continue. Please. Talk about that transition. So I did the the postdoc. My supervisor he had worked um, near Minneapolis for a company called Seagate Technology. They make computer hard drives. You know, he worked on the design there for a long time, and then he took a faculty position uh, later on in his life. And I was his first employee. Um, so that's where I got a taste of doing uh, more magnetic simulations. Um, and that led me to, so he had connections back at Seagate Technology and a job had opened up when I was in my second year of the postdoc and he said I should apply for it. And um, so I did. And that's how I got to the U.S. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also like when you entered uh, college, were you already planning to like use your physics education in some kind of in industry or maybe you know, the goal was yeah. yeah that's a good question so the goal for me was actually never to go to industry i mean uh, it was always to just try to become a university professor i mean that was always the goal um and then you know you're in uh doing a postdoc i was probably 
mid twenties to late twenties at that point in my life, you know, you get to a certain point and <laughs> then uh, you get a job offer in the U S and uh, it was very hard to turn down. Uh, I thought I could still, I know that uh, my postdoc supervisor had worked in industry and then was able to get a faculty position. So I knew that maybe I could still follow in his footsteps and have the same thing happen to me. Um, I found it hard to try to publish work when you're in industry. If you want to eventually keep those doors open and go back to university, you still have to publish work, publish papers and get involved in research. And, you know, you have to get with the right group of people when you're in industry to continue that because it's, it's not that easy. Okay. Um, I found actually when, when I was there, um, published a couple papers when I was there and I still kept in contact with my postdoc supervisor. So that helped, but I probably didn't do enough um, to go back to, uh, to keep that door open so I could one day go back to academia. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. I mean, the next question, I guess it kind of relates to what you just said. Uh, what suggestions would you give to someone who wants to be a physicist? Yeah. So maybe for the academy, not for the industry. Yeah, I, well, I think I think you should keep as many doors open as possible. I mean, the the academic, especially like I can only speak here in the U.S. but uh, or Canada, but they are very very competitive jobs. All right, like if you apply for a job, there is probably a hundred candidates that you are competing against. Okay, so what is going to set you apart? of those hundred candidates, right? Maybe five of them will go to the university for an interview. Um, very, very competitive. So you have to, uh, if you're going to go select to be a PhD student somewhere, um, you know, if you're one of the top students, you need to publish work, right? In the top journals, you need to do kind of cutting edge stuff, right? To be relevant, if that's your goal, to go back to an academic position, right? Find a supervisor that has, you know, a good track record, right? Who has graduated several students and who publishes work in the top physics journals. I mean, if you can get papers like in physical review letters or in science or nature, I mean, those are like the high impact um, journals. It would really help you along the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you should keep everything open because, you know, it. It might not work for you. And if you eventually have to go back to or go search for a job in industry, um, you know, you want to make sure you take the coursework that's also going to leave those doors open for you. You may get burnt out at some point, right? I mean, life changes, right? I mean, you're thinking like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to do this the rest of my life. I found like I can only do something for maybe uh, seven to 10 years. And then I'm just, all right, it's time to do something completely different because it, you just get kind of bored of it, to be honest with you. Um, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's right. Like when I think about my personal experience, I feel like very deeply involved with physics, but when I think about it, it's been like only three to four years. So yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, that's right. To have other options available. So even that, like to keep all the options available, and my postdoc supervisor kind of alluded to this when I was there. He said, like, if you want to eventually maybe go work in industry for a little bit, just to go see how they do things, right? It's good to be exposed to that. And the pace at which work is done there is 10 times faster. I mean, it's very, very fast, right? Um, it's not always 100% correct. You have to make decisions sometimes when you're only 70% sure of something. Whereas when you publish a paper, you, you know, you're pretty much 100% sure that the result is is correct, right? But it's completely different. Uh, so it, it's good to uh, take coursework. For example, he told me to take coursework in uh, transducers. You, even though I'm studying physics, go in the engineering department and they might offer uh, courses on transducers. You're just applying a lot of different styles of physics, you know, combined. And it may not, you know, sometimes it's simplified, right, to treat complex transducer models but he, he told me to do that and, and that was really good advice um especially for the work on hard drives and later on i worked with um systems for mems microphones um, so all of that work was kind of uh, useful to me later on in life could you talk about briefly what transducers are yeah so um 
take like a, a computer hard drive, right? It's like transferring one kind of energy to another form of energy, right? So mm -hmm. even like acoustics, right? You take uh, like a speaker, for example. Yeah, you start with an electrical signal, right? That then uh, couples to a magnet and then couples to a mechanical system and then couples to acoustic environment like air, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to couple the different styles of physics in each domain, right? So you're, you know, yeah, you're mixing different types of physics. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I think cool. I, when I went to my latest company, I learned kind of this software, um, which I wish I would have known earlier on in my life, called Comsol Multiphysics. It's an example of using different branches of physics together and matching all the boundary conditions and allowing you to solve really kind of um, interesting physics problems. I mean. Mm -hmm. I had actually heard of that console software, yeah. but I never looked into it. You know, it's just the, the problem with Comsol is it's very expensive. Um, you mm. know, it's uh, maybe there are better educational rates, but if you work in industry, then it's not that big a deal. Those companies have money to buy the software. You just have to learn how to use it. Um, but mm. they're very well supported. They're documented. Um, they have worked examples. You can follow those and learn it very quickly. Um, all right. So this is kind of changing the topic a bit, but yeah. do you have any favorite physicists um, in the history or sure. from the current I mean, day? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, going back, I mean, Feynman was probably my favorite physicist. Um, I've read uh, many of his books and uh, the lecture series on Feynman. I, I like going through and just watching uh, interviews. There's many YouTube videos of uh, interviews with Feynman. Um, just talking about his experiences in life, and I thought he was just uh, phenomenal. I also like uh, Walter Lewin, and I watch his MIT lecture series all the time. Um, usually I watch it right before I give my lecture on a specific topic, and uh, just to get some ideas and the way he delivers the material. Um, very, very good. Uh, yeah. There's so many, yeah. yeah. Especially now with YouTube, there's just so many good... Uh, not only physicists, but just the way they present stuff, like, and they make it so interesting. Um, yeah. There's one that I recently been following on Instagram from uh, Texas A&M, uh, Tatiana Erikomova. She does these fascinating demonstrations in class, and she's like famous for it. Uh, it's very, very interesting. Yeah, so. She has so much passion. So, yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of fun. So I like to learn from them. Uh, Steve Mould, I watch his channel all the time. Um, who else? Oh, La Action Lab. Uh, I, I love yeah. Action Lab. Yeah, they're great. Anyway, so many. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And we also have, what are your most favorite and least favorite physics topics? Yeah. Uh, my favorite is probably uh, anything with uh, electricity and magnetism. Um, mm. Yeah, it's just kind of really fun especially like um anything to do with lenses law i think it's fascinating to watch a magnet fall through a copper tube i mean it's just it's so cool and it's just trying to understand that it's it's really fascinating um my least favorite i don't know um some things i just haven't taught a lot and some things i've only learned once when i was a student and i either i've forgotten it or i'd like to go back one day but like things on entropy and uh there's something called statistical mechanics which mm -hmm. i learned just once for the class that i was taking but i, I found it really hard <laughs> so i'd like to go back now where i'm not under like the stress of taking the class and taking the exam and uh just restudy it and uh maybe make some videos on it one day so yeah, like the ideas like of entropy you know i I don't know that much about it. I know a little bit about it, but not, 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 I can't solve very many problems with it or even speak very long about it. You know, it's uh, <laughs> just the concept to me, but uh, until you teach it, I find like, I, I don't, I don't know it that well until I kind of have to dive into the material and be able to answer all the students' questions about it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I guess Maxwell's distribution is a part of statistical mechanics, right? Physics or, yes. you know, for the, yeah, yeah, the velocity yeah. distribution. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah there's is... a lot of interesting questions associated with all those things, and uh, yeah, yeah, that it is also hard from my experience as well. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's That's not easy. Man. There's always yes. like uh, not easy. sometimes it's you know, for example, you study Newton's laws. You know, everything kind of follows just a nice 
prescription, you know, and then you can study more complicated problems. Sometimes I find with those upper level topics, it's, uh, you, there's a, sometimes I wouldn't say hand waving, but there's some things you just have to take for granted. And, uh, you know, yeah, you, I ask too many questions to myself and then I, I doubt myself when, when I start learning it, you know, it's like, and the books don't tend to cover it for whatever reason, because they're, they're only 300 pages and not, you know, 4,000 pages. Right. But, you know, I struggle with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so sorry. So I also asked on the questions. Why did you start your YouTube channel, Physics Ninja? Yeah, good question. Um, and also, it is a later question, but where does the name come from, Physics Ninja? Yeah, yeah, they probably started at the same time. So I, uh, so why did I start it? Um, so I was working for Seagate Technology, and this was near the end of my time there. Um, I knew I was going to leave. Um, within one year, something happened over there and it was time for me to go. Um, so I said, well, I'm going to go become a high school physics teacher. That was the goal. So uh, to become a high school physics teacher in the U.S., I would have to go back to college to get a, a teaching certificate, um, two years um, back in college. So I was like, okay, I signed up to go to the school and then I said, well, let me just, uh, there was a college on my drive into uh, my workplace. And I said, well, let me stop in over there. Maybe I could just volunteer, just work at the student help center. And I know they had a tutoring center, but I had to do this outside of the work hour. So it was usually like very early in the morning, 7 to 9 a.m. And most students, they didn't like to wake up that early. So <laughs> I was like, oh, well, I got to be able to like reach other students somehow. So I started a tutoring Um local students in the in the neighborhood uh, i forget how i found them i was probably back in craigslist days i would just post a tutor available in this uh, area and i had a few students and then i started looking on youtube and i was like well maybe i can um, get started making some videos so i had a kind of a pretty good computer we had I had to figure it all out. I had no idea how I was going to do it. And there was different styles of videos at that time like i didn't know whether i was going to do like a chalkboard or um and now kind of uh, enjoy this system here with just uh, the whiteboard on the screen with the writing I, I think that that works pretty well it's kind of clear um so i just started doing that so i made one video and i didn't know what i was doing and <laughs> you know, yeah i learned a lot actually at the beginning it's like uh everything about audio many videos i did at the beginning the sound i had a bad microphone i had just a lot of things going on it's uh Wow. It's been a fun journey, actually, uh, just learning about it. So. Mm -hmm. And the name Physics Ninja, well, then I I think I started out, actually, the first week, I was probably online Physics Ninja. <laughs> and then it was like, oh. it was too long. It was like, <laughs> well, let me see what's available. So I, I did kind of a search, and I know there was somebody called the GCSE Physics Ninja. And I think GCSE is an exam in England. Uh, maybe like... Uh, college entrance exam, uh, something science, uh, yeah. like general science uh, education exam that people take, and there's a physics component to it. So I, I knew that they had a channel and they had already like um, 200 videos or something. Um, anyway, I, I looked uh, in the US, was it trademark number one? Um, yeah, I didn't want to kind of get sued for doing anything. So, and there was nothing there. So I said, well, I'm going to be Physics Ninja. I looked on YouTube. I could save that name and I saved it. And then I filed for the trademark. And so I did get the trademark for Physics Ninja. <laughs> There's my trademark. Mm -hmm. um, valid for 10 years. So I'm only halfway through and just have to <laughs> renew it. And so, yeah, I, was kind of, I think it's kind of a good name and uh, kids kind of like it. You know, it's kind of kind of a cool name. You know. Uh, then I had to get a logo. So at the beginning, I just looked, I just did a Google search for for, for nin ninjas. And then I added like an equation to it. Um, then I went on a Fiverr and I hired somebody to draw me a logo for like $20. They, they can create four logos for you. And I picked one and it was good enough. And then I changed the font a little bit. And yeah, so yeah, just started like that. Uh, going on eight years, uh, November. So yeah. mm -hmm. it goes fast Yeah. It's fun, the YouTube uh, environment, actually. It's fun to watch it grow. And yeah. I remember like the goal was at the beginning to make a little bit of money, you had to get 100 subscribers. And I remember I was just there. 
<laughs> and then that week they changed it to a thousand. So I was yeah. like, and then I went down to zero and then they changed the to a thousand. Then it took like several months to get there, but it's okay. <laughs> I eventually got there and uh, no, now it grows pretty fast. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to get feedback from students. It's fun to hear that you've helped students in a way. And Mm -hmm. I get a lot of emails and other opportunities have come up from that channel. I mean, it's unbelievable Uh, how many, you know, I could almost do it full time, I think, but. uh, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it it is definitely very helpful. I think, uh, and I don't know, I don't remember when it was, but I think one of the first video, one of your first videos that I watched was about a rotation matrix you know oh yeah yeah sure yeah yeah that's not that two. long ago you know i just did those and so where do i get the ideas for these videos um 90 of them so i tutor kids in my office here okay mm-hmm. or online uh typically over the us and canada sometimes all over the world um, um Usually when they come up to me with a problem, uh, I ask them to submit a PDF of what they would like to work on before. So then I load it up and then we're ready to go. I share the screen and we solve them. So 90% of all the videos are uh, videos that I helped a student who is who hired me to be a one-on-one tutor with them. And then I always say, well, maybe other people are also <laughs> looking for help on that video. And I I just solved the problem. So it's fresh. I could just kind of make another video in like 20 minutes and, you know, I'll put it on YouTube. And that way uh, it benefits the student who just worked with because they can go back and watch it. And it helps, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, hundreds, maybe thousands of other kids who are looking for something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so another question is any book recommendations to study physics? I mean, this can be uh- like textbooks or. Oh, I took out my favorites. So, okay. oh. <laughs> so which is why my, my shelf is a big mess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, many of these are available online, but I, I have hard, co- I'm a old, so I like hard <laughs> copies of the book. I can't have a PDF of a book on my screen. I find it's, it's not for me. So, so I do have a lot of books. Um, my favorite for undergraduate, uh, first year physics is this one here. This is by a tipler. Um, called just physics for science and engineers i think this is the best book um there are many good ones uh there's so many i have this other one by knight uh knight is a famous book also very good for uh conceptual physics but if you want to do like real real physics uh, for first year um that book by tipler is uh is the best book um, so uh then my other favorite book uh, which i've just kind of been looking at lately that i'm uh, working through now is uh, this book by Griffiths, this oh, famous book. It's almost yeah. used by every uh, single college for like uh, yeah. your introductory course on electrodynamics. Uh, the book by Griffiths, it's it's really really good. Yeah. And I think people also like the book. I mean, yeah, I remember... it's, it's very good. You know, and I've looked yeah. at it when I was a student, and I've looked at it when I was studying for a comprehensive physics exam. And I appreciated that book way more the second time when I went back to look at it. Once I I was a little bit older and I, I knew the math a bit more, I wasn't so scared of it. The first time I was just, the, the math was very intimidating, all these integrals. And uh, once I got comfortable with that, then it was good to go back to that book. Uh, it was great. Um, one book that you, everybody needs is, oh, I like this one. Anything by a, this guy, AP French. This one is called Newtonian Mechanics. Um, it's really good. Yeah. Anything by this author is, uh, he published, I think, four or five books. I've studied most of them. Uh, this one, Vibrations and Waves by AP French. Uh, he has a special relativity book. Um, very good. Um, I also love these uh, outlines. I don't know if you guys have like Shome outlines. Um, this is the Shome outline on theoretical mechanics. Yeah. Um, these are very, very good. I have one on something called Lagrangian mechanics. This one's very, very old. Hard to find these books. Uh, yeah, I found this one. I think maybe an old professor gave it to me, but yeah, so I mean, many good problems in there. It's it's really, really fun. Yeah, but as far as I know, we don't, I mean, in Turkey, we don't use Shalm outlines, but I've heard people online talk about them. Yeah, they're almost any topic. It's just like very short introduction to the topic and then worked examples and then a whole other series of problems. Yeah, they're they're pretty good, man. If you just I like to just the way that I learn is just solving a lot of different variations of problems. 
throw different geometries at you. And uh, so those books are great for getting examples. Um, yeah. Oh, what else? Oh, this one, everybody needs to also. It, you need this book. <laughs> the Art of Electronics by Hurwitz and Hill. is. Uh, this is the Bible for everything electronics. Um, if you're going to be a physics uh, person, you will have to work with electronics, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Uh, and you must study that at, at some point in your life. Um, mm -hmm. Get beyond Kirchhoff's uh, laws for simple circuits, and you have to deal with op amps and you know, uh, other devices. Um, so it's good to at least use it as a reference. You know, Sometimes it's just there. Uh, you need to look up something uh, quickly. Um, definitely need that book. What else? Books, that's, books that I really hated but you will suffer through if you go in to study physics is the classical electrodynamics by uh, Jackson. Um, yeah. This is the hardest book. You know? Yeah, I think people like Griffith's takes to this book a bit. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> this is the level after. This is usually the graduate level textbook. Uh, very difficult. Um, later on in life, I discovered, so every like uh, field in physics has its own I call it a Bible, but, uh, you know, like classical electrodynamics is, <laughs> is the book for classical electrodynamics, but there is a very good one for acoustics. If you ever want to learn acoustics, I discovered this one in my other job called uh, acoustics by Baranek is, uh, yeah, it's probably the most famous acoustics book out there. It just covers everything. And it's, it's, I just love reading a chapter of it every now and then. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's very mathematical. Acoustics is very mathematical. Huh? It's, uh, Right. Even worse than electrodynamics is what I figured out at the end <laughs> of my seven years there. Uh, I think at this point, I have no idea what acoustics is. I mean, I know the yeah. word, of course. But yeah, just like sound nice. waves propagating through like, you know, tiny holes or uh, tubes of different mm -hmm. cross sections. And then, uh, you know, solving wave equations in different geometries, like in a speaker or like a horn. Very difficult problems and all the assumptions that go into there, right? Because you have a compressible fluid. It's, uh, yeah, it's not easy. Uh, yeah. Mm, okay. Well, I think this is a this is an interesting one. Uh, do you prefer a more mathematically rigorous or conceptual understanding of physics? I mean, not that they are exclusive of each other, but yeah. if you had to choose, maybe. You know. Oh, I don't want to just, I like the math part personally, you know, but you know what, sometimes people just want to talk to you about a subject, right. Who are not subject expert. Right. And if the second that you write down any equation, you've already lost them. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that if you want to just have colloquial conversations with people that you're still able to present stuff conceptually, right. Forget about any math. Right. I think you'll reach a much broader audience, right? Look at the most successful like YouTube channels, for example, right? Um, they never present any math, right? They just present uh, the concept right behind it. Um, I like to do both though. I think if you mm -hmm. can have both tools and be, you know, especially if you're going to go work and solve actual physics problems, right? Not just uh, educate people or entertain people. Um, you know, if you really want to solve physics related problems, then, uh, you will, you will have to have a more rigorous approach. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's fun too. It's fun to manipulate equations and, you know, present certain approximations, right? As you get older, you learn that almost everything we do in physics involves some approximations or you've left out a lot of things that are maybe unimportant for this spe specific problem. Um, yeah, I like also, I mean. Like one one example that I can give, like a couple of years ago when I learned, when I started, you know, using calculus for physics. Yeah. I mean, we had those before that. We had the kinematics equations. Yes, yes. And I mean, when we are given, let's say, that acceleration equals a constant times t squared. I mean, you yes. automatically try to substitute it in that yeah, equation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so many work. people... That's the first thing they do, right? They use the kinematic yeah. equations, right? And they forgot that, it's oh, yeah, right. those are only valid if uh, you have constant acceleration, right? Yeah. Um, so, like, I guess if you know the rigorous, I mean, it's not that rigorous, but, like, if you know the derivation of it, yeah, you understand that you take the acceleration out of the integral, so you can't yeah, so actually it. use that yeah. formula, yeah. So, maybe yeah, that's... Yeah, so it's important, yeah, especially if you want to make, like, uh, quantitative, <laughs> any kind of quantitative uh, analysis, uh, Right, the the rigors 
is needed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And also, what parts of physics education do you think in schools or, yeah, in schools basically, should can be improved in college or in high school as well? Yeah, I think doing more uh, modeling, you know, uh, you could do it at a simple level, even just using uh, something like Python, you know, where you don't have to be a computer scientist to kind of program, but even solving all of these kinematic problems, and then you can make them a little bit more complicated. If something is sliding off a dome or sliding on a curved path, right, how would you actually calculate in that case because if you, you try to do it with pen and paper by integration you run into problems right quickly quickly right most students won't be able to do it okay um but maybe they can do it numerically right numeric and then it's powerful because you can apply this technique to everything and you can start with the simplest numerical methods like uh integration with a small delta t time step you know uh, we do in first year lab we do a lot of work with spreadsheets you know we could solve a lot of physics problems just using spreadsheets and that's kind of the first level but you know taking it to a language like python and learning how to do that i think is is useful you know yeah. and also i mean if someone wants to learn that themselves i mean how did you learn it i guess it wasn't a part of coursework or maybe it was yeah um it was probably in coursework for me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was later on. It was like year three or year four of undergrad. Mm -hmm. uh, I took okay. a computational physics course uh, and you learned how to solve, you know, any kind of differential equation, a partial uh, differential equation. Very useful. I mean, to know these techniques. Um, and again, it, it covered so much material because it was only a four month course. So you just kind of scratch, uh, scratch the surface. Uh, later on in life, when you work in industry and then you use specialized techniques, but you still understand the basic building blocks behind it. Um, so that was always useful. Yeah. yeah, okay. And also, I mean, I can ask this for myself as well and for maybe if in anyone in the audience. So if a, like I could ask it, what suggestion would you give to someone who thinks of starting a physics YouTube channel or math YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, so you, I've changed mine a little bit uh, lately. I, I think you have to do everything. So you have to pay attention because you want people to watch your videos, number one, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. the goal, right? If you don't want people to watch the videos, then you do whatever you want. But I think that's the goal is to, you want to teach something to somebody, but you want it to show up on their feed, right? Or show up on whatever YouTube algorithm uses. And the number one thing I found is you have to spend time on the thumbnails. Mm. All right. That's number one. Number two is you have to publish videos at a constant rate. Okay. If you're going to take like a month off, uh, it's not good. Okay. You want to at least on a weekly basis. I've read like, ideally it's two videos a week um, that you want to keep putting out content. Um so one way to get around that for me, and I'm kind of busy, but maybe I can do a short a week. A short is only 15 seconds. I mean, especially now that I work at the college, I could go into the uh, our our lab room where all the equipment is, and I could show like a simple physics demo or something. Um, yeah, so just putting out content at a regular rate and working on the thumbnails, you know, having kind of a constant theme, I think is helpful. Um, and people just recognize that too. Like I always try to use like the same uh, yellow strip with the title. And then my name is down there at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And people then recognize that, especially if they like, like one of my other videos, they're probably more likely to watch. It and then, then it jumps out at them right away, right? That, oh, I saw a physics ninja video on this. Maybe I'll, you know, I can watch his other one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I noticed you changed. You used to have like a white background and now you've gone to the blue and uh, yeah. Yeah. So I guess you like really looked into it because yeah, it's been a while since I, oh, maybe you looked at the popular ones though. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I think I, I pulled it up uh, first when you reached out to me and uh, yeah, this morning too, I was looking at some stuff that yeah. you did. So, yeah. And yeah, I could ask it, I mean, for personally, if, if you watch like a couple of them, what suggestion would you give to me? I mean, about the presentation, maybe the pace. Yeah, no, I think they're, they're it's really good. It's clear. The writing's clear. Mm -hmm. uh, the explanation is is uh, for what I watch. I watch the rocket uh, equation derivation. I watched oh. uh, 
yeah no it was all good yeah it was good yeah, I'm amazed I that you could do that stuff with high school I was like oh man he's like you're way smarter than I was <laughs> I mean like I mean we were shown it we, I mean yeah I didn't come up with the derivation but yeah no, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, you know, this derivation was done, you know, by probably by Newton years ago, you know, <laughs> well, maybe after that. It, yeah, I, it doesn't matter if somebody's done it before. I mean, you're here to teach. I mean, we're we're all, we're all just looking at stuff in a different way, right? Everyone's going to present it in a slightly different way, and that's going to click with some students more than others, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's okay. And <laughs> you know, they say everything in physics, actually, especially in math, actually, everything is math is. Everything in math is named after the second person to discover it after <laughs> Euler, there you I go. say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Euler. <laughs> we were doing like some graph theory and I like learned recently that he's the founder of it. Yeah, okay. I was surprised to see Euler, Euler's name there. It sure. turns out he's the founder. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. So yeah. Uh, very cool. Yeah, okay, I, mean, I guess this is it then. Thank you so much for... Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's nice meeting you. 